the colonials felt really badly about it. The colonials also pointed out, hey, you did not fight well yourself, but take a look what happened to General Braddock. There had been an assault made on Havana that cost the lives of more than half the troops sent there, but Havana was given to Spain instead. Havana, you know, is today the capital of Cuba. And the colonials said, hey, we paid for this with our blood. We took it. We won it. We lost half our men doing it, but it was, it was simply given back. Now, the war left, I mean, wars were expensive. The war left Great Britain very, very deep in debt. And they began to look to the colonies. You must help us get out of debt. This was the beginning of the end, you might say. All right. In 1760, George II died. George II lived to be an old man, and he outlived his son, Frederick, Prince Frederick. So when George II died, the throne went to George II's grandson, Frederick's son, George III. So George III was only 22 years old. He was young and he was inexperienced, and a word had gotten around all over England that George III could not do his lessons as a school child. He had difficulty learning to read, difficulty learning arithmetic. Um, even though some people would say, well, he, he did study hard and he learned uh, Greek and Latin, but whatever, he was not, he's not been looked on as being very bright. Anyway, he was young, inexperienced. In his attempts to be king, his mother would tell him, be a king, be a king. He was determined not to be a figurehead. No, he wasn't going to do like King Charles. He knew that King Charles I had his head chopped off. He wasn't going to be a complete tyrant, but he was going to try to manipulate. Now, he manipulated by going from one prime minister to another, and by going from one policy to another, and by even resorting to bribery, which in those days, bribery was illegal. Today, he would be kicked off the throne for that. But in those days, he was, so he would actually go into Parliament and buy votes in Parliament or buy off high up government officials to get his way. He started off, don't worry about this name, John Stewart as head of his cabinet of ministers. We don't worry about that. Now, Pitt, um, now Pitt, we do want to remember him. Anyway, Butte opposed Pitt's expensive war policy. See, I have two men high up in the King's administration at odds with each other. When the war ended, Butte was the one who negotiated the treaty, even though, keep in mind, Pitt had won the war, done a lot to win the war, but nevertheless, Butte got to negotiate the treaty. And the Treaty of Paris led England to give up some of the territory that seized during the war, again, all in an attempt to keep the peace. Then Butte decided to keep a standing army in the colonies. All right, a costly move. But here is the problem. They couldn't afford barracks for these colonies and couldn't afford to feed all the soldiers, especially 4,000 miles away. So if you had lived in the colonies at the time you'd owned a house, you'd have probably received a knock on your door one day, and if you opened it there outside was a British officer with a bunch of soldiers behind him, and he'd say, you are to take two of my men and keep them in your home, whether you want to or not. You're expected to care for them, you're expected to feed them, and they're, good. they're here to protect you. They're also here to, to protect you from the Indians, should the need arise. Well. That's why in our Constitution we have a clause that there shall be no quartering of troops in private homes in peacetime without the consent of the owner. It's a part of the Constitution that's never enforced because the issue has never come up in our country's history. We've never quartered troops in private homes, but the British did that. Well, there were concerns that there'd be an Indian uprising. We knew the Indians were discontented, and that actually happened. A bunch of prophets arose among the Indians who told them they should reject trade with a white man and return to their old ways. And the reason they were suffering at the hands of the white man was because 
the great spirit was angry with them because they had rejected their old ways of living. So uh, they began to get together. They took all the forts west of Detroit, in other words, on a map. Uh, Detroit is right over here, near a little tiny lake called Lake St. Clair. Detroit's right here. The Indians took all the forts west of here. Now keep in mind, this area was really thinly settled at the time. So the Indians had the advantage of numbers right here, but that did not last long. Well, now here is the problem, big problem, folk, and this is one of the things that led to war. When an Indian uprising occurred, let's say it occurred somewhere in, uh, what is today, Indiana, by the time the news reached the east, it might be about a month old, then if they took a sailing ship and sailed to Britain to tell the British government, hey, there's an Indian uprising, that took a ship three or four months to get across the Atlantic, then it would take the British government a month to round up an army, and another four months to get a bunch of troops back here. By that time, eight months would have gone by, eight or nine months. Well, I mean, that, that was really, really slow, uh, even by those standards. So in the meantime, a bunch of Scotch-Irish from Pennsylvania, they decided that they were going to fight the Indians, and in retaliation, they went out and just you know, killed some friendly Indians. Again. This is what often happens when a vigilante group gets together. Vigilante, you may know the word vigilante means groups of people who try to enforce the law by their own means without the approval or consent of their government. This was basically a vigilante group. They killed a bunch of innocent Indians who didn't deserve to be killed. But finally, given enough time, the colonials united with the British Army and they defeated the Indians. At this point, the Indians learned that the French were no longer there to help them. Well, the British government showed how little it understood. They passed the Proclamation Act, which said, okay, here, to make peace, we will not allow any settlers to go west of a certain line I don't know where the line was, but basically they drew a line and said, all settlers are to remain over here. The Indians can have all this territory here. Now, you might think, hey, it wasn't that an equitable agreement, except for one thing. It couldn't be enforced. Now, today, with our GPSs, our computers, our internet, our airplanes, our helicopters, and our ability to move fast, our instant communications, our telephones, we could probably enforce a kind of they could not, simply couldn't. Settlers, when they ran out of land here, they simply moved across the line. And again, the British government wondered, well, why can't you stop them? Why, well, hey, we don't know where they're at. I mean, these people move in, and again, they're hard to find. And also, there were too many of them, too many moving in, too much. And uh, again, these kind of settlements were never to work until after 1890, when the Indians were finally forced to live on such bad land that no white man wanted to move in. And by that time, we had the telephone, the telegraph, and instant communications. And we had means to make sure that no white man moved in, even though no white man would want to. The Indians were then, like I say, were able to live on their reservations. But, um, all right. I'm going to pause here. All right, um, now, the next of the king's chief ministers tried to find a way to pay the big, big British debt. Now, folks, this, okay, the United States has a debt to, today that would make the British debt look small, but we're not trying to pay it. Instead, we're going deeper and deeper. Yeah, but that's something else. But in those days, they tried to pay the debt, but they, were t they wanted to collect revenues from colonial trade. To get around the taxes, the colonies resorted to smuggling. Well, particularly 
There was a law that was passed before, even before the French Indian War, we talked about the Navigation Acts, that said all colonial ships had to trade only with Great Britain. Well, many, many a British sea captain will pull into a port, at, you know, a French port or a Spanish port and find colonial ships there trading with the French and the Spanish, the West Indies people, even the Germans, or whoever they could trade with. And um, this, of course, upset the British government greatly. Well, also the French were trading their cheap molasses into the colonies, which meant that the colonial people were not buying British molasses, especially since the British molasses had a tax attached to it. Um, molasses was used in making rum. The French did not care about that. But the colonials drank rum in abundance. Um, again, I had a student some years ago do a report on alcohol among the... Uh, now, we're going to find out later that the colonial people, the American people, wanted to curtail drinking, particularly when factories were set up and the trains started setting up. And uh, train owners did not want drunken people operating their trains. They did not want people who were drunk operating their factory machinery. So uh, they tried to curb, but at this time, everybody in the colonies drank rum or something similar to it, practically with no exception. Anyway, um, the Revenue Act was passed, also known as the Sugar Act. The Revenue Act lowered duties on French molasses, which uh, gave the colonies some incentive to pay the tax. But it gave the British ships the right to stop and inspect all vessels for forbidden material. The word contraband here means stuff that would be forbidden for them to carry abroad, to sell abroad, except to Great Britain. So the British ships would oftentimes stop a colonial ship. Well, this did not stop smuggling. The colonials smuggled. Again, keep in mind the Atlantic Ocean is huge. And folk will remind you something about the, even in today's world, Pirates will come off this coast of Somalia, and you might think, well, with today's satellites, can't we spot the boats? No, these pirate boats are often too small to be spotted, and they'll come off in the... But the Atlantic Ocean is much, much bigger, and they did not have airplanes and satellites in orbit, things like that, so uh, a ship had a good chance of getting away. And also, if the captain happened to spot a British ship, if he had his men set up full sail, they had a good chance of outrunning the British ship, particularly the British warship, which was laden with heavy, heavy cannon, and was often much, the merchant ship would be much faster than the British warship. So uh, the British warship could often be outrun. Well, now here, folk, a lot of people believe that this was the one thing that actually caused the war. The Currency Act. The colonial governments, as I think I've mentioned, had very little silver and gold coins, so they got rich by trading in paper money or IOUs or in banknotes. The Currency Act told colonial governments, you may not issue paper money. Problem was, there was not enough gold to go around. And a lot of persons believe that more than anything else, this act stirred up the colonies. Because colonies would find that their paper all of a sudden did not have the buying power that they thought it had, especially since the British were not, was not going to accept this payment, and they had no way of getting hard money because there just wasn't that much money, hard money to go around. The colonials said this was an intrusion of the British into colonial affairs, and what right do they have to govern us, especially when we have no representatives in Parliament? Well, this leads us up to the Stamp Act. The Sugar Act did not bring in revenue, so Greenville had the Parliament pass the Stamp Act. There were people can do without the sugar or they get you from somewhere else. The Stamp Act said that all important papers must have a stamp and a stamp had to be paid for in silver coins. Stamp Act. And almost everybody in Massachusetts had to have a document that had a stamp on it. What documents had to be stamped to every important document? The deed to your property had to have a stamp on it. Your marriage license, if you got married, had to have a stamp on it. Birth certificates had to be stamped. Death certificates had to be stamped. And uh, 
everything, every important paper that you had, contracts, yeah, contracts between one party and another, had to have a stamp on it. All, um, and it's the, all important papers, like in, in most of the colonials needed the papers that would have the stamps on them, particularly if they owned the property or married, and if they signed a contract, if they had children, I mean, all this stuff would require several stamps. The colonials considered this really dangerous because um, they said that they are taxing us, imposing a tax, and we are not represented in Parliament. Now, folk, the American Revolution is one of the few revolutions in history that has actually worked. What do I mean by worked? Well, in 1917, the Russians replaced the Tsar, shot the Tsar dead, and they got Lenin and Stalin. I can't say that revolution worked. In 1959, when I was still an elementary school kid, Cuba got rid of Batista and they got Fidel Castro. I can't say they were better off. Time and time again, revolutions have failed. Uh, Oliver Cromwell's revolution, Puritan revolution against the British crown wound up failing. Most revolutions throughout history have failed. But one revolution that appears to have succeeded was the American Revolution against the British. And it was different from the other, and it was, they were not trying to get new laws going, they were just trying to get the king to obey laws that had been on the books in Great Britain for hundreds of years. The idea that, that taxation could only be done through represent, representative in Parliament, that law had been on the books in Great Britain for something like 600 years. Five or 600 years. And laws about trial by jury, that one had been on the books in Britain for some 700 years. They were trying to get the British government to treat the people in the colonies like they were treated in Britain. But the problem with that was the distance was too great and the expense was too great. And the question of who was going to bear the expense of Great Britain governing from such a distance, um, all this was to lead to a war that might have been inevitable. Well, the law stipulated that the stamp collectors would keep 8% of the revenue collected, the rest would be turned over to the government. That meant they, every dollar they might say they collected, they kept eight pennies of it, which, uh, you know, assuming they sold a lot of stamps. Well, to his credit, Governor Hutchinson realized the Stamp Act would not work, but he was over here. The British government was over there and they thought, well, hey, we've got to let the colonists know that we have to have this Stamp Act. And also the Parliament had never tried to tax the colonies directly, except for maybe the Navigation Acts, which had aimed to trade. But here was an attempt by the colonies to actually stamp, to actually impose a tax without the uh, tax being levied by elected legislative body. Now the colonies had been paying taxes. They had been paying taxes to the local governments before. The local governments were voted in and the colonies were willing to pay taxes under those conditions. But now they were asked to pay a tax levied by Parliament. The colonies had no representatives in Parliament. Would the problem have been solved if the Parliament had taken in some representatives of the colonies, this is something folk will never know. Uh, another solution would have been for the parliament to have allowed, this would have been a better solution for parliament to allow a parliament to be set up in, this, in the colonies, and then parliament collected taxes through the representatives in an American parliament, just like it does today. Canada has a parliament, Australia has a parliament, Scotland has a parliament, Wales has a parliament, and each of these parliaments vote and the taxes are collected. But it's collected through representative voting and not just imposed without representatives. But this idea was not around back then. All right. Um, well, when the British government heard the colonies objected to not having representative parliament, the British said, well, all British subjects are virtually represented. In other words, regardless of where the, the uh, people in Parliament reside, that uh, a person in Parliament represents everybody 
throughout the whole British Empire. Um, now, folks, this is why in our own constitution we have a law that the representatives of senators from each state must reside in the state to elect them. So Georgia's two senators reside in Georgia. Pennsylvania's two senators reside in Pennsylvania. Every one of Georgia's representatives must live in the district that elects him. Every one of Alaska's representatives has to live in the district that elects him. Every one of Texas' representatives lives in the district. Now, of course, today, if a person if a, wants to be elected and think, hey, I can't get elected where I live, he can get up and move, and moving is fast and easy these days. But at this time, the very rich people who have established and who made up most of the representatives had a hard time moving. They couldn't just up and easily move from one state to another. I mean, they, got, they would get rooted in a certain place, but today it's different. But anyway, you, we have a law that the representatives have to live in a district that elects them, the senators have to live in the state that elects them. But there was no such law at the time. Colonial leaders said, this is not representation. We want representatives who actually are colonial peoples, born in the colonies, reared up in the colonies, and who will look after our own interest in Parliament, the British government rejected it. The colonists had been given seven months to respond to the Stamp Act. Colonial legislatures got together and debated the act. Patrick Henry urged the House of Burgesses to pass resolutions against it. So Virginia was the first state to say we're not going to abide by it. Other colonial leg legislatures followed. Um, in Boston, like I say nearly every one depended on paper, so it would have to be stamped. Samuel Adams collected a group around him called the Sons of Liberty. Very important. Samuel Adams um, said that uh, we are not going to obey the Stamp Act. Andrew Oliver was a stamp distributor. Samuel Adams decided I'm going to make him resign. With no stamp distributor, there'd be no stamps. So an effigy of Oliver was made out of hay. He was hanged. Then the effigy was beheaded. There was a mass demonstration that uh, down, I mean, uh, spoke out hard against Oliver in very loud tones. Oliver resigned. Couldn't take that. Can't blame him. The leaders who have tried to enforce the Stamp Act found themselves under attack, their homes were vandalized. The home of Governor Thomas Hutchinson was for all practical purposes destroyed. When the Stamp Act took effect on November 1st, no one dared enforce it. Thomas Hutchinson resigned as judge, though he continued to be a lieutenant governor and later he was governor. But uh, he saw that the Stamp Act would not be enforced. The stamp distributors resigned in droves. They'd hoped to make a lot of money, but then they realized, hey, you know, our families are in danger, our homes are in danger. <clears throat> a group of colonists met in New York called the Stamp Act Con Congress. They sent petitions to the British government, and that is one reason why in our Constitution we allow petitioning. But they um, sent petitions to the British government against the Stamp Act. They said the Stamp Act is depriving us of our liberties, thus making colonial people slaves. Colonial black slaves did not notice any change in their status. Now, at this point I digress and talk about Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry made a scathing speech one time. He said, is life so dear and peace so sweet to be purchased with a price of chains and slavery? He said, our chains are already forged. I repeat it, our chains are already forged. You can hear their clanking up in Boston. And the slaves took notice, but they didn't notice any change in their own status. While the white, their white masters were talking about slavery, they were remaining in slaves. They were literally remaining in slavery themselves. Well, 
The British said, hey, we're giving you protection. You're ungrateful to us. Here we are protecting you from the Indians. We protected you from the French. You should help pay the cost of the war. Well, the Stamp Act was repealed, but Parliament said that it had the right to govern the colonies any way it saw fit, again, with no representations in Parliament. All right. Um, now, make it long. I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to cut it short. I've already mentioned that colonials were forced to quarter British troops without consent. The New York Assembly said, our people, we're not going to enforce the quarter troops. You don't have to enforce it. The acts of this assembly were declared null and void by the British Parliament. The colonists everywhere began to fear that their own elected assemblies would not get to govern them at all. Daughters of Liberty, these were women who got together and said, we're going to boycott British goods, and we're going to learn how to make clothing for ourselves. We're going to learn to use a spinning wheel, and we're going to uh, not buy British tea. Boston Massacre. A bunch of Bostonians began throwing sticks and rocks at British soldiers. The British soldiers leveled their rifles on them. When it was over with, five Bostonians were killed. John Adams, the cousin of Samuel Adams, said that the British soldiers deserved a fair trial. In a court of law, the British soldier declared not guilty on the grounds that acted in self-defense. Now, today a court might not do things that way, even though when I was, yeah, I hate to say when I was your age, because that's what I've heard a bunch of my life, but when I was about the age of some of you, four college students were killed in Kent State, Ohio, and I'm in Ohio myself, Kent State by the National Guardsmen. The National Guardsmen were reacting to bottles and sticks and rocks being thrown at them. But um, again, we don't, well, it turned out though the four students who were killed were not even taking part in the rioting. So that, that's what a lot of times happens when you, and nobody knows who gave the order to fire. But in the case of the British soldiers, the a court ruled that they had acted in self-defense. John Adams saw to it that they were given a fair hearing, a fair trial. The Tea Party, the British government imposed a tax on tea and they sent their ships loaded down with tea to collect the tax. They hoped the colonists would unload the ships. Instead, in Boston, a bunch of a bunch of Bostonians dressed as Mohawk Indians went into the ships, boarded the ships, and threw all the tea into the Boston Harbor. In the meantime, south of there, they had a in the Annapolis, Maryland, they had a tea party where they burned all the ships carrying the tea. There were tea parties all up and down the eastern coastline. And in other words, the tax on tea simply did not work. Well, the colonists began to form committees of correspondence. This was actually the first attempt to unite the colonies at work. Essentially, what they were doing, they were saying, hey, if, if uh, Great Britain gets out of line down here in Virginia, we'll keep you informed, and in turn, you keep us informed. So uh, the committees of correspondence were a colonial link of a bunch of horsemen who would ride carrying messages back and forth from one colony to another. The British had wanted to pay judges out of revenues cut the tea tax, but the colonies subjected and they formed more committees of correspondence. Make a long story short, things got worse. Colonials hadn't been drinking British tea for some time. Because of a lack of tea sales, the British India Company, East India Company was hurting. By the way, we don't know who, to this day, I don't think we know who, dressed as Mohawks and threw the tea into Boston Harbor. That was kept a super, super secret that uh, I believe has been kept to this day. Finally, the British, as a result of the Tea Harbor, passed some laws, coercive acts. Under the coercive acts, Boston Harbor was closed. What this meant was that a whole lot of Bostonians were thrown out of work and had a lot of time on their hands now to spy on the British. The government was 
the governor and a council were now to be appointed, not elected, basically taking all democracy away from Massachusetts. If a royal official were accused of, tri of a crime, he was to be tried in England. Military commanders could quarter troops in private households if they wanted to. Quebec was given the land west of the Appalachians. I showed you that on the map earlier, how that uh, the land west of the Appalachians was given to the province of Quebec. Right here. Now, Quebec was given this territory here, again, because Canada was not as rebellious. Simply stated the Canadians did not participate in the rebellion. The Canada is separated from the 13 colonies by a large, large area of wilderness. That uh, the 13 colonies were like bunched together, Canada was separated from them. Um, the Americans said, well, these are intolerable, and they called them intolerable acts. Now, there is one more intolerable act that I'm going to mention. The colonials were ordered to not treat Catholics as inferiors, and this time I'm going to have to side with the British government on this issue, uh, because uh, there was, now, folk, again, not in any way, I mean, I know some of you might be Catholic, and not in any way that I'm promoting any kind of anti-Catholicism, but in American history, just like racism, anti-Catholicism is a big part of American history. And uh, it, you know, we'll talk about it again when we come to Millard Fillmore, President Fillmore. We'll talk about it again when we come to President John Kennedy, anti-Catholic sentiment reared its head in 1960. I was 11 years old. When, but uh, anyway, uh, but it's run throughout a lot of our history. Um, again, there were attempts made to keep Catholics from holding office and to keep Catholics as second-class citizens. This was a part, this, I mean, it's there, folk. It's just like slavery, it's just like racism. It's an ugly part, but every society, every group has an ugly part for history. No exceptions. No group is perfect, nobody is perfect. But uh, in order that, I don't have that listed here. As, but it was one of the issues that I would have to side with the British government on. All right, the delegates then sent, I mean, were sent to Philadelphia and they called the First Continental Congress. The First Continental Congress was not an official Congress, but they affirmed that they sent a dignified picture to the English government that we do not believe that there should be taxation without representation. They said we're going to continue to boycott English goods and we're going to continue to meet and this time we'll have an official, to make it official, they had to write up a document, a constitution, and have a legal means. So these were just men who had gotten together, most of whom had been elected officials in time past, but who had their jobs had been taken from them by the king. Now, again, when we come to, de to the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, he'll say, the king has imposed governors on us without our consent. He has imposed judges on us without our consent. He has forced us to pay for these governors and judges out of our own revenues, again, without our consent. All this is in the Declaration of Independence, and yes, the king actually did this, the governor. Anyway, um, General Thomas Gage, and yes, this word should be capitalized. He replaced Governor Hutchinson. When Governor Hutchinson was gotten rid of, he said uh, to himself, if I give a show of force, I'll quieten this down. Well, in the meantime, southern colonies were looking over their shoulders at their slaves, fearing their slaves would take advantage of the turmoil and rise up. There weren't that many slaves in the north. Now, a bunch of colonial people started storing arms and ammunition. Again, they had a lot of time on their hands now that they were not employed. They formed militia unions called Minutemen. The Minutemen said, we can get ready to fight in a minute. If we're asleep, we'll wake up and have our clothes on and our guns in our hand within a minute. If we're plowing in a field, we'll just simply drop our plow and leave our wives and children to take care of our horses or mules or whatever, or oxen, and we'll drop our plows and go and uh, form a unit in a minute. Well, General Gage requested that the coercive acts be repealed because he saw that they were really creating a lot of uh, agitation but instead the king wrote back, or the government wrote back, arrest all the rebels. 
and he did not get his reinforcements. So Gage thought, well, what I'll do, I'll sneak on Colonial Ammunition Storage Catch, and he learned, I mean, there were people in Boston who were loyal to him, to the British, and he learned that there was a cache of arms being stored at Concord. So he thought, I will go to Concord while the colonists are asleep. Unknown to him, he was being watched. One of the men who watched him was Paul Revere. Paul Revere had a system. He said, I'm going to post, if, it, if they're coming by land, I'll post one lamp on a church steeple. If they're coming by sea, I'll post two. Paul Revere noticed the British soldiers getting out of bed and starting to march westward. He posted one lantern, which meant they were coming by land. Then he got on his horse and began knocking on doors. Now there was another man who also went around, William Dawes. William Dawes went one way and Paul Revere went another. They began saying, the British are coming, the British are coming. And they began shouting out loud. If, if they got no response, they'd go in and knock on the door harder to make sure that the owner inside heard. To arms, to arms, the British are coming. Well, now, the British went to Lexington, and there at Lexington they found a bunch of colonials. And folk, what happened next is one of the biggest mysteries. A shot was fired. I mean, that's, that's certain. Who fired it? We don't know to this day. Some Britishers said the Americans did. Some Britishers said that one of them did. Some Americans said the British did. And some Britishers, some Americans also said one of them did. I had a high school classmate who's now deceased who wrote a story said, I was hunting rabbits one day and I just couldn't come home because I didn't catch one. And then at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I saw this rabbit, I jumped this rabbit, I got up my gun and fired a shot and later learned my shot was the shot heard around the world. The shot that was fired has been called the shot heard around the world. I mean, whatever, whoever fired it, it might have been some hunter hunting in the middle of the night. Anyway, the two sides started shooting at each other. When it was over with, about seven colonials lay dead. The British marched on to Concord where they found no ammunition, but they found a bunch of troops waiting for them. They started shooting each other. The British officer ordered his men to start heading back to Boston. At first they marched, then they started to trot. Then they ran at full speed, running for dear life. Their bright red coats made easy targets, were easy to hit, and a lot of them were killed on the way. More British soldiers died than American colonials. Uh, this next part will not be on the test, but the governor of Virginia called the slaves to revolt. They noticed that this governor of Virginia, who was appointed by the king, did not free his slaves or plan to free the slaves. So a few blacks got their freedom, more did not. Okay, everybody have a good couple of days. I hope to see you all back on Wednesday.